people here. This is great. Okay. Welcome to Bookswell Read and Relate, um, a vid chat series. And tonight we're focused on poetry. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we're coming together in the midst of a very difficult moment for the world and for humanity. And we are not um, alone in this. And that part of the reason uh, this series is happening is to bring us together in this difficult time. Uh, I'm your host, Cody Cisco, and I'm very excited to also be uh, inviting into the Read and Relate series our co host, Mariano Zaro. Welcome, Mariano. Hi, Cody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, to, today we are going to have uh, three wonderful uh, poets. We're going to have um, Kim Dower, Alicia Elcourt, and Stephen Rains. Uh, I want to thank all of you for saying yes to this experiment. This is my first, uh, my first online reading, so it's just to see what happens. And thank you, Cody. Thank you very much for uh, putting this together. It's, uh, it was a pleasure work. It is a pleasure working with you. So before um, before we start with uh, the reading, I have a question for uh, for uh, Kim and Alicia and Stephen and um, Cody. Um, I think framed the reading into this uh, into the the idea of uh, secrets and what to say, what not to say. So my question for for you, uh, Kim, Alicia, and Stephen is: If um, how do you manage? Um, censorship uh, to yourself. Do you censor yourself when you write? Do you evaluate what to say? Is this too much? All that negotiation. So that's the question before we start. Any answers? I don't censor myself. Uh, there would be no point to, to doing that. For me personally, I may after look at the poem and decide if I want to reveal any of the information that's in the poem, but I tend to see my poems as not autobiographical. They're made up and they're written from a persona. And I, uh, what's the point for me of writing if I have to worry to censor it? I may write a poem and decide not to, tr not to publish it or to wait but there's no stopping as the flow is coming because it would ruin it for me. Uh, what about you, uh, Stephen? Oh, I'm a high self-monitor. So I'm someone who's um, always concerned, like I'm not a, um, I'm not always like socially at ease or um, I'll always like think back on a conversation I had and kind of cringe most of the time. But uh, with writing, that doesn't happen for me. And I just, I deeply trust the page and the process of writing. And I think it's one of the first places in my life I had that freedom, uh, especially growing up in a household that was very, uh, I'll say punitive. And, and so I always felt like I was being watched and judged and, and there, was a lot of, um, there was a lot of criticism. But with writing, it was just between me and the page. And so I've kind of taken that into adulthood uh, and it's been quite freeing. And what about you, Alicia? I, I think I have learned to self-monitor less. My poetry is very personal. Um, and I think when I first started writing, I was a little timid, but I've learned um, through friendships poetry friendships, how to lay it all out. And um, as someone said, I may choose not to publish something but or share it, but I find poetry very healing to write. So I go there most of the time. Thank you for your uh, answers. Um, I think I, I relate to uh, what you said, Alicia. I think in the beginning I was more hesitant and I was more like um, self-conscious. Also, I, I was very um, insecure about the, the value. Like, is this what I'm gonna say has any value? Uh, even, you know, it's from my, it's, a, it's an anecdote from my own life. What's the point of, of saying this? And then I will censor myself and I won't say it. And it took a while to trust, um, 
uh, myself and uh, the message of the poem, whatever message it is, to, to let it be outside. But I think in the beginning, as, as Alicia said, I was more hesitant, yes. Um, anything else, any, any other? Um, I, I'll just say, Mariano, that on the moment we get rid of the idea of what's the point, that's when we start to write. Wonderful, yeah. You know, it, then we edit. Of course. We, we might ask what's the point of that word or that line, but we can't ask what's the point when it's coming. So um, um, let's um, continue with uh, the, the reading section. So I th the, the order I have selected is to start with, uh, with Alicia and then uh, Stephen and then Kim, and then I will, I will read um, poems at the, at the end. So um, if you are ready, um, yes, uh, Alicia, let's start with, with the reading section. Okay, um, my first poem is got a very long title. As Mariana says, it goes on for days. Um, I, I write a lot. Um, I like to take uh, mythology and fairy tale and deconstruct it and look for fresh ways of um, looking at how stories represent social structures and how to change those. So I chose one of the uh, one of those poems for the first poem. Sonnet for Icarus's older sister who would have invented the aeroplane had she not been married off for gold. Also, she can divine the future. I fly with red-tailed hawks over fields of asphodels, a dream too soon to wake from. Doomed to babies and brushing my hair, oh sweet Icarus, boy who runs slowly, loves the pool of earth and his feet planted collects lavender and sage, mint to balance the body's humors, women's work that would bring him shame. Instead, we'll pay for our father's sins. Late at night, the house quiet, Icarus teaches me what he's learned. How I love him, his head of curls. I have studied well in these books, poetry, geometry. The father must never know what I have learned. Imagine landing in a meadow of orange scrub, navigating wind pressures and fluctuations, callo saido shapes shifting in my mind, triangles, rumbi. If I were allowed, I'd build a flying bird to save my brother. I can imitate the lift of eagles and want to soar. Look at me, brown hair, bull chin, amber eyes. I am disappeared from history. Lachesis, clotho, atropos, must you cut his thread? This boy, terrified of heights, not an ingot of pride. My uh, second poem, um, the title is from a Mary Oliver poem. Um, and I wrote this after an experience I had with my, with my niece. Um, or sometime, well, I'll let the poem speak for itself. <laughs> called You Don't Have to Be Good. What I'm asking is when will they stop murdering little girls, decomposing bodies under scrub brush, teddy bear yards, blood ropes, necks twisted. I'm with my niece surrounded by spruce and black oak, a sky as blue as lapis, the patter of unseen deer and mice, a soft trill through the forest. Kate has planted herself across the yellow line on a private road the ascent too much for her defiant bones, arms crossed, five-year-old legs splayed, body secured to pavement. I won't move unless you carry me, she says. Her father was to meet us, but he's delayed, so I try. Whoever makes it to the top first wins, to no effect. Unable to lift or carry her in my fear and desperation to keep her safe, imagining a car around the bend, splattering the last bits of her across asphalt, I throw out the only card I have left. I know you are such a good girl, you'll get up right now and walk with me. Why did I think that would work on my niece, all vinegar and obstinate blood or determination a sport of Olympic proportions? When her response comes through lungs at full volume, steady and sure, I am not a good girl. Face red, spittle around lips. 
I know the answer to my own question. I can feel the souls of the murder girls converge and dancing their skin knees, purple tennis shoes, red ribbons. I know this moment is transformational, that the soft chemistry of my own DNA has been altered, that Kate is the unknown X, the equation solved. The culmination of genetic strands reaching back to the beginning of time has given me permission to express the full texture of my being. I am certain there are others like her blooming all over the country. The season is now. I moved down the road to the bend and breathed in the scent of wild current, alert to flag any vehicle, letting Kate decide when she's ready and when she's willing to head up the road. The next poem um, is about, you know, when you're with people and they tell you of their suffering, there's not a lot you can do. And in this poem, I imagined how I might do, how I might have done something. The time Ray reached across the table for the potatoes and his mother sliced him with a steak knife. Reaching was impolite, she said. 60 years later, we faced the wind ocean at our feet. I want to rise, a black finned whale or a cormorant cresting gray waves dissolve to ether, travel myself back to Ray's mother's oak table where at hand is eight year old self a bowl of potatoes slathered in butter and salt. I'd offer soup with fresh okra dusted with orange peppers. There'd be strawberries plucked at the edge out of an immense forest where children would have played all day fashioning bows and arrows from tree bark and minted sea glass. As my skirt swooshed into the next room, I'd say, if there's any more, anything more you'd like, you can grab it off the table. I know children are hungry. We walk the bay's perimeter, counting stars against a dark sky. Ray's corona of white hair lifts with the salted air. It's hard for me to love myself, he says. And the last poem I'm going to read um, is about um, how grief makes you crazy and a little off kilter. Rose petals. Father is lowered six feet under his casket directly above mother's. He'd had a midnight premonition he was going to die, which he did three weeks later. He'd asked us to unearth our mother so that he could be buried underneath her. She needs to rest on me, not the other way around, he said. My sister and I sat with the funeral director while he reminded us about Jewish law, never disturb the bones of the dead. Besides, there's a layer of concrete above her in accordance with state law and the jackhammer. It would be expensive, not to mention imprudent. On the other side of the world, father would be below mother. That's how it will have to be, I say. And if we want to get downright metaphysical, above and below are relics of linear perception where infinitesimal specks in an unfathomable universe. So can you really say which end is up? I'm flinging red rose petals on the casket, grabbing every last flower I can find. I want my brother and sister to throw a few too, but I cannot get their attention. They're talking to guests, shaking hands, hugging, I need them to throw rose petals. It's killing me that they don't see the magnificence of this gesture. My parents watching from above each petal a rune for a magnitude of love and grief. We haven't even finished mourning our mother who died only four months ago. I stand at the edge of the pit, careful not to trip on my heels or fall in myself. The cemetery plot my parents paid for monthly over 20 years is prime real estate with a view of the mountains. White clouds twirl everywhere, whirling a breeze in this wicked heat. I lift my arms to dry the dripping sweat, which leads me to gravity. Starlings fly over the trees. I spot, I spot blue jays and a woodpecker makes a ruckus somewhere higher. While I'm stuck like a fly on sticky paper to a spinning globe hurtling through space. The casket is plain white pine. By the sound of it, we were cheap, but it really is the sweetest casket. The word my friend uses, elegant. 
I sensed judgment in her comment as if she hadn't expected my family to have an elevated aesthetic or maybe it's just that my thoughts discombobulate with sorrow. I mean, who cares what she thinks will all end up underground someday. Father made their wedding bands of white, rose, and yellow gold, precious metals of the same family. Mothers fit inside fathers perfectly. I know what's elegant. A life well lived with a person you adore at your side. Towards the end, mother wouldn't turn in without a kiss from her husband. And father, he would admire his tilting towards 90 wife, his hair matted from sleep, wearing a stained bathrobe. Isn't she the most beautiful woman in the world, he'd say. I rip the blooms off a few roses, drop the petals in my pockets for later when I'm alone. I'll lay the petals down, light a candle, praise my parents 63 years together, praise their eternities. A prayer, really. A prayer. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, sorry, I forgot to, um, to introduce you properly before you're reading. Um, I, um, I have, I don't know if you can see this. Um, when I, when I think we met, I don't remember where we met. Uh, we met in a poetry reading in Los Angeles, is that right? Yeah, at, um, at um, Loyola Marymount. Okay. And then we had coffee one day. And then you brought this, um, I don't know if you can remember this, this is yeah. uh, it's called uh, Mother is a Verb, and uh, I think you, uh, we exchanged some, some books, um, uh, you know, having coffee, and that was, um, that was the, way, the way we met. And um, you have, um, something I forgot to mention is that you, lately you have been doing uh, video poems. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, I have two, and um, you know, I've worked in the uh, motion picture business and for a lot of years, so I wanted to create. You know, I, I've seen them online, and and they intrigue me, and um, I wanted to try one out. So I've made two, um, and they're on my website. You can see them there. Um, and and there, it's really interesting because the, the the fashioning of those is is much like writing a poem, because if you try to make it like a movie, it, it doesn't work, you know, because a poem is not a story, a linear story. So, um, working we'll, with it, we'll visit them. We will we will visit your website to see them. I mean, I, I have I see, I think I have seen one of them. I don't think I've seen both. Maybe I have to check that. Okay, so um, um, let's continue with um, If I could just uh, say one yeah. thing, I want to direct everyone to the chat, which has been flooded with a lot of very positive comments about Alicia's poetry. So definitely don't not see those because it's a lot of really touching uh, messages. Thank you, Cody. Thank you for saying that. Um, anything else that you want to say, Alicia? Um, no, thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's a real, it's a real treat. Thank you. Let's continue with uh, Stephen. How are you, Stephen? Doing great. Thank you for having me this night and inviting me. Um, is um, well, Stephen. We um, we had um, we had a schedule an interview for Poetry LA with Stephen. It was going to happen um, last month in, in in March. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah right before all of this happened or at the beginning of it. But because of the, you know, the circumstances, we had to not cancel, but postpone it. We postponed the, 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 um, the interview. So it will happen at one point. I, I don't know when, but so you are, you are there. You're the way, you are, you are next one in line. Um, so I, um, I did a lot of research about Stephen uh, for the interview. Uh, probably many of you know that he was the, the, the first West Hollywood Poet Laureate uh, from 2014 to 2016. He has two books published. Um, I have one of them, this one, Peritons. So you are welcome to uh, Google and find it. And then um, your first book has a longer title. Your first book is um, Your Dead Body is My Welcome Mat. Is that right? Yes, correct. 
which, which feels uh, that book came out when I was 25, and I feel like that title um, that's just such the title of a 25 year old's book of poetry, I think. So, um, are you going to um, are you going to read um, new poems today, or just you know introduce the poems a little bit? Yeah, I, I wanted to read uh, all new poems, and as um, I kept seeing all these names of all these writers uh, show up, that's why I was uh, shifting through my stack of papers because I thought um, maybe writers would appreciate this poem I'll start off with tonight. Um, and it's based off of a William Carlos Williams poem called uh, This Is Just to Say. So uh, the people who are familiar with the poem, it's about him eating plums out of the refrigerator and actually not having a sense of remorse about it. Um, he says like, please forgive me, they were so sweet. And, um, and so I thought about that kind of, that, that trait of the times that uh, we do something we're not supposed to, um, and there's regret, but there's also a lot of self-interest involved. And so I thought like, as a gay man, like, what is that for me? And so then I wrote my own poem following the same format as the William Carlos Williams poem, which is kind of like my queer homage to it. Uh, it's called, This Is Just To Say, I knew the condom broke, and kept going. You were warm and I never felt closer to you. Forgive me. Your body felt electric, so new and so wrong. And <clears throat> this is, um, this poem actually is a very long poem of mine and it's <clears throat> called West County Mall, St. Louis, Missouri, 1994. We were drinking fountain sodas for Mrs. Fields when Erica pointed out a tall woman. That's Jackie Joyner Kersey. I thought she was joking, having seen her on the family television months earlier, watching her run, her long legs like pistons, body trained into a machine that would garner three gold medals, one silver, two bronze, a black body that broke boundaries. We weren't used to seeing a black woman like her, looked up to her, wanted her to win, to prove something, not realizing all that weight we put on her shoulders as she ran, running towards those medals. Jackie's name seemed suited for a marquee for history books. She was on the cover of Time, Newsweek, boxes of Wheaties. I didn't believe Erica, who motioned towards a black couple, the man in a mid-length trench coat, a woman in a red dress walking in heels, I in the hubris of youth, the electric current of caffeine and youth in my veins, loudly shouted her first name. She slowed her gait, turned, smiled, and waved. Jackie Joyner Kersey slowed her gait when I said her name. This wasn't just anyone walking in a mall. Those weren't just any legs transporting from store to store. Her dress shoes that slowed were far from the sneakers that gripped the asphalt at the start line, waited for a fired shot and, and pushed pavement behind, thighs thrusting forward. She would keep that world record for 30 years and counting. At the age of 16, my voice slowed Jackie Joyner Percy down for a brief moment. She slowed her gait, raised her right hand and waved at us two white teenagers with soft drinks in our hands who stopped giggling, stood silently in awe as someone who ran her way into history walked before us. <clears throat> and uh, there are two more poems. Uh, this poem is about the photographer Peter Hujar, who uh, not only do I like his work, but um, He's also physically my type. So um, anytime like Peter Hujar has a self-portrait, I, I kind of swoon. And uh, as he was dying and when he died, his friend and ex-lover, David Warnerovich, took photos of Peter on his deathbed. <clears throat> and so that's what this poem is referencing. I saw the photo of you dying. Uh, I'm sorry, and he died of AIDS in the mid 90s. 
I saw the photo of you dying, your body full of virus, zero of T cells. You were unshaven, hospital gown visible at the photo's edge. David took photos of you in your last moments. I was disturbed, not just by the image of death, dying, and the devastation of the disease, but also how attracted I was to you. Even in your last moments, as your final breath exited your lips, I would have still wanted to kiss them, disrobe you from your gown, lie naked with your tight frame and curly black hair, even as you died, transmitted desirability for me to witness 28 years after your death, never having known you. <clears throat> and this poem is, um, I went through a phase of being, uh, of writing a lot of documentary poetry, which is taking events that, um, you know, kind of like documentary film, right? Um, instead of creating a fictionalized account is that we use facts and then kind of tell a story through it. And this was about a couple, Gary Madsen and Winfield Mauder, who lived in Reddings, California, and they were murdered by white supremacist brothers that they had met at, um, at the farmer's market, that they had a stand at the farmer's market. And so the brothers um, killed this couple in their bed and they confessed to killing them because they were gay. <clears throat> this is called The Message. The third voice gave it away, the just calm down and make it believable voice captured on the outgoing message. An unnecessary four hour drive to San Francisco to see a doctor, death was already in the room. Winfeld and Gary lived the rural life, a home and happy valley together, created a legacy of nature and science. They sold produce at the farmer's market met two brothers in the next booth, siblings who shared a copy of the white man's Bible, burned synagogues, carried rifles in the trunk. Gary's brother did not believe the message, drove to his brother and brother-in-law's house to find the couple naked in their platform bed, blood on the walls, 22 caliber shots to their heads, something the police would later call an overkill the supremacist brothers stood on chairs at the foot of the bed with rifles in hand, lording power and death. The brothers had it written down. These murders were a prelude to more. The fake message, the couple's final words, crackling and unconvincing, buying time while the killers reloaded new guns on Gary's stolen credit card. Maybe Winfield and Gary made love in their bed before the brothers broke in. Maybe they shared a good night kiss before they heard the first shots in their A-frame house. Maybe they were wearing their wedding bands that night when they were forced to say into their own answering machine, we've, we've come down with something pretty bad. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Um, I have a, uh, since you, uh, at the end you mentioned that you have this interest to, uh, for documentary, could you talk a little bit about the, this uh, project that you have called the Gay Rub? Because I think it's connected to this documenting uh, passion of yours. Oh, oh, I like how you connection, and I'm not so sure I necessarily made that connection. Um, I, I think there's something about preserving, I, I have an interest in preserving voices and experiences. Um, and with the documentary poetry I was writing, it was important for me to not fabricate details. So everything in the poem had to be something that I read um, and nothing that I was making up on my own. Because for me, I didn't want to fictionalize a story. I wanted to really kind of document it and give uh, an emotional experience to people when they encountered it. And my Gay Rub Project is a collection of rubbings from around the world of queer landmarks. So, um, you know, a lot of cities have landmarks dedicated to the founder of the city or this is where, you know, a certain event happened or someone was in this house. 
but I think there are a few landmarks that denote queer places of importance. And, you know, living in Los Angeles, there's a, we actually have quite a few. Um, in West Hollywood, especially, there are a lot of markers uh, dedicated to queer people and queer accomplishments. Um, and so that project people can find out about um, at thegayrub.com. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you want to add, uh, Stephen? No, thank you. Okay. So we're going to uh, continue with uh, Kim. Um, so as I mentioned before that uh, Stephen was the, the poet laureate of uh, West Hollywood from 2014 to 16. And then Kim uh, continue from um, uh, 2016 to 2018. Uh, she was the, the poet laureate of uh, West Hollywood. And she has published um, four books of poetry, all of them, I believe, with uh, Red Hand Press. Is that, is that right? Kim? Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. Um, my, um, my affection for uh, Kim was instantaneous because of the title of uh, her latest uh, book, um, this one. Um, some bathing on Tyrone's power grave because part of my um, education in uh, aesthetics was through my mother telling me to watch um, Tyrone Power. <laughs> Look at him. That's a good looking man. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he was very insistent, like, okay, don't look at these other people. Just look at Tyrone Power. <laughs> now, that was my, 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 my crush on on Titan Power as a child in, in, um, in a small town in the north of Spain, watching TV with my mother, uh, dubbed, you know, with all the movies were, uh, were dubbed in Spanish. So that was when I saw the title, I was like, okay, I have to know this woman who um, sunbathes uh, on Titan's Power grave. So what, what are you going to, to read tonight, Kim? That's very funny. I never, you never told me that before. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to start with something else, but I'm, I'll read a couple poems from that book then. Um, I chose these poems, oh, who knows why I chose <laughs> but uh, I ch the first poem I'll read uh, from Sunbathing on Tyrone Power's Grave is called Unruly Aura, because I think we are all so desperate to go back into the stores, and I write... Uh, like Stephen ha has a series where they're real. I write many poems after visiting stores about real experiences that happen in the store. This is called Unruly Aura. The cashier at the health food store tells me I have a beautiful aura. Wait, I tell her. If you wanna see a really beautiful aura, wait until I've taken my Renew Life Ultimate Flora Probiotic. After that, my aura will knock your socks off. She smiles at me and rings me up. My money has a beautiful aura too. My dollar bills float out of my pink wallet. The man behind me swells from the heat I generate. Each step I take brings me closer to God, the final fabulous aura. Take my hand, I tell her, squeeze my aura. It's hungry and looking for someone to devour. That's actually about visiting Erwan. Uh, <laughs> and I so miss those afternoon trips for the coconut milk, you know? I'm sure we've all been there. Um, the next poem from Sunbathing on Tyrone Power's Grave is called Alternative Facts. Uh, and I never wrote what you would call political poems, but I think we were all sort of forced into that in the last couple of years. And uh, this one seems very relevant today uh, after I injected myself with Clorox just to make sure I wouldn't get the virus. Um, but no bad effects so far. Anyway, this poem is called Alternative Facts. The sky is blue because that's the color my child likes to draw it. Two plus two, if one of the twos is pregnant, equals five. The earth is flat. Columbus, a fabulous guy, fell off the side. He was also a loser who didn't build a wall 
to protect himself. The sales lady with a pencil stuck in her bun caught me borrowing bell-bottom jeans at Morris Brothers when I was 13. We do not all bleed. In fact, blood is not always blood red. Blood is a different color in different colored bodies. I'm telling you, and so it's true. Facts only work when we need them to. Take this knife and jab it into my guts. Columbus is still inside me, discovering America. So a uh, third poem I'll read from, from Sunbathing on Tyrone Power's grave is called, He Said I Wrote About Death. And uh, the title comes from th this book, which, which Mariano showed you, but th this book is dedicated to my first poetry teacher ever, whose name uh, is Thomas Lux. He was a great teacher and a great poet, and he passed away very tragically a couple of years ago. And when I sent him this last manuscript, he said, you know, you're writing a lot of poems about death. And I, I didn't re realize that. And so that night I wrote a poem called, He Said I Wrote About Death. And here it is. He said I wrote about death and I didn't mean to. This was not my intent. I meant to say how I loved the birds. <clears throat> how watching them lift off the branches, hearing their song, helps me get through the gray morning. When I wrote about how they crash into the small, dark places that only birds can fit through, layers of night sky, pipes through drains, how I've seen them splayed across gutters, piles of feathers stuck together by dried blood, how once my car ran over a sparrow. Though I swerved, the road was narrow. The bird, not quick enough, dragged it under my tire as I drove to forget. Bird disappearing part by part, beak, slender feet, fretful, hot. I did not mean to write about death, but rather how when something dies, we remember who we love, and we die a little too. We who are still breathing, we who still have the energy to survive. And I'm gonna end with a poem from a book before uh, sunbathing called Last Train to the Missing Planet, which looks like this. It's the last poem in this book. And you know, sometimes I think our poems are prescient. Like we write a poem years before the situation happens in our lives. We write something and then a few years later we read it and think, wow, I've caught up with my poem. And this is a poem I've caught up with. And uh, it's dedicated to all of us, the world who, uh, we're stuck at home and we all feel like we're going insane, basically. Uh, and the poem is called Candlelight Asylum. Do not enter my candlelight asylum where we dance in our terry cloth robes, hair pinned up like discarded Barbies, our feet crushed in pink ballet slippers. I lied. There is no one here. I am all alone, just me in my grown-up sled bed, comforter around my feet, head propped with flat pillows, no cases yellow around the edges, a furnace coughing up wet music. This is no place for someone so alive, juicy, abundantly humane, so soft in her silk underwear. You may enter, but only you, you with the smile and dark hair, you with the stride, the hands. You look like you could get me out. And I trust you will. Come on in. No one here but me and the candles. Though they're burning fast, room darkening as the breeze pours through the windows. I don't even know your name or where you're from. 
please take my slippers. No one is listening. My inside voice, my inside words, no one hears, not even the handsome nurse who brings me my tray of kisses. Oh, I lied again. There is no nurse. Don't believe a word I tell you, but please take me away. Do I have to wait for disaster before someone plucks me like a wilted daisy in the jar by the window, places me in a clear water in silver in a silver vase? Hurry before sunset goes bad. Join me on the last train to the missing planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that a, is, I mean, is, is this, this is my first, as they say, my first um, um, online reading. So it's, it's a strange feeling, but it's so beautiful to be reading with, with all of you. And also I'm looking at all the people, um, you know, watching. Um, it's, it's intimidating, all these big names, you know, a lot of uh, great poets. So thank you very much for, for watching. Um, I'm going to um, read um, <clears throat> poems from uh, the book Decoding Sparrows. is the book that was published last um, fall by um, <clears throat> uh, What Book Press. And I had all these uh, uh, plans to do readings the, at the Los Angeles uh, Book Fair and to go to Santa Barbara and here and there, but everything now is uh, postponed. So I'm going to read poems uh, for you. Um, and then I'm going to close with uh, one new poem. <clears throat> I'm going to start with the, with the title poem, Decoding Sparrows. My father and I on the balcony watch dozens of sparrows walking on the roofs across from us. A sparrow doesn't really know how to make a nest, he says. They are messy. Now a stork does different. A stork makes a perfect nest. My father looks at the clouds. Can you tell a male from a female sparrow, he asks. No, I can't. I say, what do they teach you in a school, son, he says. Look, male sparrows have a dark stain on the chest, like a bib or an apron. Females don't. And I look, and there they are, chests with aprons, chests without aprons, everything in order, dirty or clean, white or black, male or female. I cross my arms against my chest. My father doesn't look at me. And then he says, but we are not sparrows, you know. The next poem um, introduces Spanish. It's not, uh, sometimes it's not easy to find how to combine both languages. Sometimes I use uh, Spanish and I don't, uh, I don't add the, the English version. But in this case, there's a little dance between uh, the Spanish text and the English text. But the frame, <clears throat> the frame of the poem is in English. It's called Street Vendor. Lo que le agrade, señor. Lo que le agrade. Whatever you like, sir, whatever you like. The young girl is sitting on the sidewalk. She repeats her litany with tired enthusiasm. Vendo pulseras, pulseras de todos los colores. I sell bracelets, bracelets of all colors. It's Sunday evening and the last tourists walk back to their hotels, warm showers and soft blankets. She sells bracelets in the streets and train stations at restaurant patios before the waiters ask her to go. She may be seven or eight, has long hair, thin wrists, fast, precise hands, chipped nail polish. Yo hago las pulseras, señor, con bolsas de plástico. I make the bracelets myself, sir, with plastic bags. She tears the bags open with her front teeth, braids the shreds, 
tie the ends. It's fácil, she says. It's easy. She is alone, this girl. Alone like the woman I see some mornings walking on the freeway divider. ¿Dónde encuentras las bolsas de plástico? Where do you get the plastic bags? I ask her. En la basura. In the trash, she says. And basura sounds like amethyst, cathedral, two rows. A veces, pocas veces, she says. Las trae el viento. Sometimes, a few times, they are brought by the wind. Um, lately, I am um, writing poems that uh, take language from other disciplines like biology or medicine, and I try to incorporate that language um, into the poem. So this is, I'm gonna close with uh, this poem, it's called Thermostat, and then we may have a couple of minutes if somebody has a question. So this is Thermostat. Turn down the thermostat. It's so hot here, my mother says. She's sitting in a wheelchair near the window. The thermostat is a white plastic box on the wall. It has a small digital screen, two buttons, the shape of a triangle, plus and minus, a dial with tiny indentations, and the on-off switch. It doesn't work. The nursing home has central heating, but you cannot control it from the bedrooms. Are you my son or my grandson? How old are you? Are you my son, the one that lives far away in that far away country? Why don't you want to have children? She asks me. It has been snowing all morning, just stopped. Look at the snow, she says, so clean. I am reading a brochure the doctor left earlier. Brain cells lose their ability to communicate with one another. Two abnormal structures called plagues and tangles are prime suspects in damaging and killing nerve cells. Let's go outside, my mother says. The park across from her window is covered with fresh snow. We cannot go outside, mother, in this weather, I tell her. At least open the window. I cannot breathe, she says. Plagues are deposits of a protein fragment called beta amyloid that build up in the spaces between nerve cells. Tangles are twisted fibers of another protein called tau that build up inside cells. Take your children to the park. Play with them, she tells me. Snow is wasted when you don't have children. Open the window, my mother says. I want to feel the cold. I don't think we can do that. You may get sick, I say. Who cares if I die today or tomorrow? Open the window, she says. Just for 15 seconds, I say. I hope they don't see us. I take the bed's comforter and swaddle my mother, wheelchair and all, like a cocoon. 15 seconds, I say. I open the window. The cool air enters the room like a giant, like an ice river. Fifteen seconds, I say, and we count together, whispering, and I close the window. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Cody. Um, I think we have like uh, five minutes. I don't know if you want to um, invite uh, somebody to ask questions or... Yeah, I'll start us off with a question. And if, um, if anyone has a question, please put it in the chat box. I think that'll be uh, the best way to do it. So, uh, and then we'll po pose the question to our participants. Um, I was wondering about, about witnessing and how when you're composing a poem, are you, are you called to witness something specific? And are you, 
does it change in terms of are you called to witness something dark or something light? And has that changed for you in your more recent um, composition of poetry? Anybody? Well, I think your last poem um, about just kind of that moment with your grandmother, that's, I, I'm sorry, your mother, that was so beautiful. I'm still like caught, I'm, I'm, I'm still back in that poem. Um, your, your last, your latest collection has a lot of reminiscence about uh, your boyhood. How yeah. did you choose, how did you choose which moments uh, that you wrote about and which ones didn't? Well, I, I th in my case, particularly, poetry has a lot to do with obsession. I think we go through life and certain things um, keep happening in your brain. Uh, sometimes they are very uh, relevant moments, like, you know, the, I don't know, the, 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 death of your, the death of your parents or something. But sometimes it's just um, a moment that it may look small, and maybe we don't know the meaning of that moment in, when it happens, but it keeps happening in your mind. So I think um, when, I, when I wrote this book, Decoding Sparrows, um, it was an exercise of, uh, of remembering uh, and also an, an exercise of, of accepting my, my obsessions. You know, why is this uh, still happening in my mind? And something um, that was surprising to me is that memory has a magnetic quality like if you remember one thing like one neighbor from the childhood all of a sudden that neighbor brings somebody else or that neighbor had a dog and the dog one day ran in the park or whatever and then all of a sudden all this it has a magnetic quality um, and it was also kind of parallel with uh, with the fact that my mother um, was losing all uh, all her uh, memories so it was this kind of um, double way trip of, of remembering and forgetting um, that was my experience. We have another question for Mariano. Um, and this one is, do you write your poems in Spanish or English? I have done, um, I have done, I have done everything. I have, <laughs> done poems, I have done poems all in Spanish. I have done poems only in English. And I also have done uh, books that are um, bilingual editions. So I do the one version and then the other one. And sometimes I use both languages uh, in, in one poem. Writing, um, writing a bilingual book um, is, um, is like a dance. I don't write one version first and then the other one. I write something, maybe say in Spanish, and then I do the English version. I continue in English, I do the Spanish version. So it's more like a braiding activity or a, or a dance between the two languages. Um, but the, the, the last book, um, it was kind of my effort to, to write the whole collection uh, only in English. It was like, my, okay, let's, let's try this for this book. Oh, there Here you are. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Yeah. I, uh, I do want to say uh, Bookswell is going to do a giveaway of a copy of Decoding Sparrows this week. So if you follow us on Instagram at Bookswell Club, you can enter to win this uh, signed copy of um, A Marvelous Book of Poetry by Mariano. Thank you, Cody. Any other question before we close? I, well, I'm kind of curious about if we have time. I'm curious about your experience, right? But um, so this is what this is your sixth uh, book. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so then the five books previously, you would have book release parties in person, and and so now community and getting the word out about your book is it's a very different experience. Um, could could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I, I lost your your sound for a minute. Sorry. Oh, okay. Just that. Um, I'm thinking about how this is a very different book release experience than you've had previously. And um, though I think there are more people with more time to now read poetry and, you know, devote to, to your book, at the same time, it's, um, it's kind of nice to have community surround you uh, when a book comes out. Yes, definitely. And I think we are, we are like, uh, you know, we are people poets like we like to, to be in contact and you know to do a, to do a reading to go out for a drink or something so yeah all, all that celebration gets a little uh, muted but 
Um, I think we, you know, we, I, I was able to do a, a couple of readings, like live readings uh, for the book. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is a great opportunity to use um, uh, the virtual reality to, to continue with, uh, with, uh, with the readings, but also to, um, to connect. Maybe this reading uh, wouldn't have been possible um, because our schedules in a in a regular life, but because <laughs> because we are all home, maybe you know it was uh, it was somehow helpful for us to, uh, to to collaborate. Yeah, we have had a few more questions come in. If you're willing to to play, <laughs> um, there's a question around: Do you think that poetry is an art that everybody should try? Why? Oh. Do you not try this, Alicia? The, the question was if, uh, if poetry is an art that anybody should try, is that right, Cody? Yeah. Okay. I believe so. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, as children, we all have, we're, we're so playful, whether it's with art or, or language or poetry, because we're not censoring. And then we, we grow up and we learn to censor and there's just so so much to be gained from from writing poetry on so many different levels. You know, it's it's language, it's beauty, you know, it's it's metaphor, it's um, personal, it's um, spiritual, it's worldly. Um, and it's an opportunity to sit down and 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 reflect on what Wait, you know, I've had this experience where I don't really know what I'm thinking until I sit down to write about it. And then, and then I realize what, what I actually do know. And um, poetry is kind of a, a focus on that. It focuses the mind for me. What about you, Mariano? Um, <laughs> I think that the, um, it's interesting. Poetry is such a, um, is this creature that changes all the time. So it has a very uh, playful and uh, frivolous side. You play with words and sounds, but then at the same time has all this revolutionary, very deep uh, component. Um, so it's, um, I think, why, I mean, I think everybody should try and um, maybe, um, I, I always say that for me, writing poetry has been a, a way of discovery. So, I hope it, it also works for, for somebody else. Um, but if some, uh, you know, um, maybe some people have no, no much attraction to it, but, but it, it is a very powerful, it's a very powerful uh, source for sure. Well, you know, the other thing I wanna say is, is I, every person we live in two worlds, we live in this physical world that um, appears to be the dominant world. Um, but poetry brings us into the other world. And I, I wanna use the word spiritual, though that might turn some people off. Um, but, you know, it's that world we, when we're looking at a sunset or a kitten or, um, you know, we have an ecstatic experience. And I think poetry tries to, um, by, by reading and writing poetry, we, we get to step into that world, which for me sometimes is more real than this physical world that you know, jobs, traffic, shopping, you know, all that. And, and I think everybody lives, lives that way. And it's, for me, it's just a great opportunity. But for some people, it might be painting, it might be singing, it might, you know. Yeah. I've done a writing workshop for um, almost 20 years now. And it's one of those things that uh, I think it's a great question. And also I would say like, it can't hurt um, to just give it a try to, to write poetry. And I think that for some reason, writers feel very like, oh, well, I'm, I'm a screenwriter. Oh, I'm a novelist. And um, I really think that poetry is the language of our emotions. And I think it's the quickest way to access emotions. And those, and though, you know, every so often there's those fired articles about like, is poetry dead? And I always think, like, whenever I look at, like, okay, who wrote this? I think poetry is going to be at your funeral. That um, poet, and and I mean every combination of that. That poetry is going to still be around, 
And also it's going to be read at that person's funeral. If there's something about it that really calls to our emotional experiences. I'm sure most of the poets here, um, you know, reading or listening, you know, we get those emails like, oh, I'm getting married. Do you have a suggestion for a poem? Um, and the same thing with funerals and, and other events. It's, um, there's really something about, about poetry that it has a power that um, is unique to, the, to poetry itself. There's and a question. I, I actually a text from Kim that she keeps going in and out for and her, her service. So she was here for a moment and now she's not here. I'm glad we got to hear her read. I was worried that she wouldn't make it back in, but um, those are really great. There's another question that came in through Facebook Live. Um, so does Mariano write his stories down when they come to him? Is there a kind of wave which happens where the story unfolds itself in a line and then the magnetic quality happens? Any tips for recalling specifics? So a little bit about your process and how a poem unfolds for you. Um, I have said this a few, few times for me, writing is, uh, is terrifying, it's very difficult. Um, so normally, this is what normally happens. Uh, the poem uh, starts like a little movie in my head, um, maybe a few lines or a few words, but it's, it's in my head for sometimes for a, for a month, for a year, for sometimes for a longer time. And then there is, a, there is a moment that the movie is just too, it's just too wild to, to be contained and has to be, has to be out. Of course, when you start writing this, this movie that was in your head, what's gonna happen on the page sometimes goes somewhere else. So you may have this, uh, this you know, uh, poem in your mind and when you start writing, um, you discover something else. And that's for me, the, um, that's the moment of truth when you kind of let, it, let go the, your idea of what is in your, in your, in your mind. And then you, you accept whatever is happening in the, in the moment. And it's, um, it's a little bit, um, there's a little bit of vertigo in, in that moment. And I think that's why I, um, and that's, I think that's why it for me is, is uh, it's terrifying writing because it's like you you release you let go of certain things and you try to to process what is what is coming up from the page. So just um, um, you know be brave and um, and just go for it. That's my advice. <laughs> Stephen or Alicia, do you want to comment about that process for you? How the poems unfold for you? Um, for for me, it's um, it's it's all different. Um, sometimes I write because I something uh, pissed me off and I have to correct it. Um, and that's when I usually write um, fairy tales and uh, mythology. I, I feel like I have to correct the narrative. Um, and sometimes I write. Um, you know what Mariana was saying there's a moment that happens and it just stays with you and, and I have to come back and revisit it until I can um, excavate what what attract what why that stayed with me why that moment stayed with me um, and some poems I write and 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 you know with a little editing they're there and other poems take you know seven years to, to get it right so um, but I also um, yeah, sometimes sitting down, I, I find that once I sit down and I start moving through it, that, that the, the terror that Mariana is speaking of dissipates. But, um, but yeah, when you first sit down, there it is, kind of uh, naked with the page. There's, there's a question here for you specifically, Alicia, about um, being drawn to myth and how you decide to choose which details to include in the narrative. Um, I, I love fairy tales. I loved them since I was a little kid. Um, and then as I got older, um, I started to uh, resent some of the narratives, some of the paradigms that were present. And so that's why I like to deconstruct them. Um, I wrote a poem about Medusa because, you know, I, I saw her as a, a hum, uh, you know, uh, a long-suffering person who had a lot of rage, justifiable rage, 
she was uh, raped by Poseidon. So I felt like, you know, that was, I was really drawn to that and I wanted to, I wanted to write that story. And then once I, once I get the, the poem down, then I start playing with word choice. And that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's the fun part. Um, you know, what, what, what word supports the poem. And, you know, they, there's that saying in, 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 in all writing, you know, kill your babies, because we get so attached to our, our lines. But um, sometimes you can't see that until you come back to the poem a couple of months later. You're like, oh, God, get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we tend to overwrite, you know. And um, one of the things I love about Mariano's work is it's, it's just, it's, he's so... Um, He's so talented at just leaving just what you need to tell the story. And you get the whole story, like uh, that thermostat poem. You know, there's, there, there's a novel in there, but we have it on the page, you know, one page. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Sure. There was a question in the chat about where um, readers could find that poem specifically, Thermostat. Uh, I included a link to your website, but if you want to tell us, was it which book that appears in? Uh, Thermostat um, is, I don't, I don't, it's not, it's not part of uh, Decoding Sparrows, okay. but I think, uh, I think it's going to be uh, published online soon. But so I will, um, um, I can, I can, I can, Put it on my website when uh, the link to the to the magazine, but it's not part of uh, it's not part of the coding sparrows. No. Okay. So we're at seven ten. Uh, that's and, all the questions I think that have come through. But if there's anything else, if each of you want to say or a question you have for each other, we do have time for a little bit more. Well, Cody, I want to thank you for organizing this. It's no easy task to kind of like gather not only poets, but an audience and people who are interested in it. Um, and Mariana, thank you for, for asking me to be a part of it. And I love that, like, as Kim was reading, like, all of Kim's poetry books are here. <laughs> your anthology is in the next room. Um, so, and Mariana's is uh, across the room on a different shelf where you would be. But, um, it's, it's so nice to be here with everyone. And I appreciate everyone um, listening and the, and the thoughtful, comments and and chats that are happening it's such a nice event to be a part of it at such a dark time kim you're muted please unmute i want to hear you <laughs> oh uh oh. maybe i maybe i've got to do it i think you muted me there, there we you are. are there you are i i feel terrible because i lost my internet and kept struggling to get back um so I missed uh, the questions and answers, I, and uh, I wish I hadn't, but this was lovely. And um, thank you for, for doing this. I just wish I'd heard some of those questions and answers. We'll be um, putting, putting the, the video up. So if there's a question that you want to answer, I mean, I'll, there, we do a lot on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. So there's still opportunities to participate Great. and engage. Yeah. But it's really fun. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kim. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. We, at some point, had 51 people on oh. the Zoom alone, and then additional people were watching via Facebook Live. So I'm so happy we were able to bring your poetry to people who wanted to hear it. It's great. Um, thank, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Yeah. <laughs>